Good afternoon. 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 Good afternoon.
Can you avoid flying into these things? Yes. Yeah, so it's not the balloon themselves that are going to destroy German planes. Now, guys, during the Battle of Britain, before and after it as well, as there were times where there were over 1,200, 1,400 of these balloons flying in the sky above England. Now, what, what they did with these, and these were manned by crews of 12 people, maximum height, 5,000 feet. Okay, so you had 12 people. This is the key. This is a steel cable. So if you put these around strategic places, like airfields, like radar stations, that the German dive bombers, remember the Stukas? The dive bombers come in, they don't want to play in these steel cables right here. You know what I mean? Because if your cable hits, if your wing hits one of these cables, it's either going to send you into a spin or it's going to rip the wing off. Okay, they say about 2,000 pounds of drag if you hit that at 200 miles an hour. Okay, now, if you do hit the steel cable, guess what's going to happen? A little parachute's going to pop out and create more drag. Would that be the right direction? Yeah, yeah. Right direction. Okay. So is the balloon itself just like what? It's filled with like hydrogen or helium. Hydrogen? Helium. So what if they just want to like shoot them down? Okay, they could shoot them down. Okay. Um, so they would put these around the key areas. All right. Now, the other thing it helped with, remember when I was talking about radar. Radar would tell you how many planes were coming, what direction they were heading, but it couldn't tell you altitude. Okay, so the German bombers would want to fly above these. Remember, you put these at 5,000 feet. Okay, so if you know the German bombers are flying at 5,500 feet or 6,000 feet, and you're trying to sh send a shell up in the air, you know, like a, a shell, fire it up there, and it explodes, hopefully hitting the, the plane, the cockpit, the engine, knocking them down. Okay. The British called these ACAT guns. These are anti-aircraft guns that fire up like a grenade up into the sky, and it explodes. Okay, and it sends out metal, pieces of metal, into the plane. And they're shooting these things off, man, trying to shoot down these planes. Well, if you know what altitude to get your shells to blow up at, you're more accurate with your, with your anti-aircraft fire, yes? I think, strategically, guys, these did not have a big impact on them. <laughs> okay, but they were a daily reminder that they were doing something to protect their island after months and months of bombing. Okay, now Eisenhower later made a joke about this. Eisenhower, you guys heard that name? Okay, he was president, but more importantly, during World War II, he was the supreme Allied commander of all Allied forces in Europe. So when we got ready to launch D Day from England, in 1944, we had planes, all the soldiers, three million men, all the tanks, all the supplies for massive army onto the island of England. And Eisenhower said, it's only the great number of barrage balloons floating in the sky above the island that kept it from sinking into the sea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good stuff, okay? So you'll see these in pictures from time to time. You'll see them in movies, and, and they're just called barrage balloons, right? Um, they were somewhat effective. Now, uh, I talked about the Anderson shelter that you would put in your backyard, okay? If you had a little bit more money, you could buy one of these. It's called a Morrison shelter. Now, this is like a steel box with, like, chicken wire there, and you put a mattress in it. And you could sleep in your house. Uh, there's an air raid. Yeah, the house comes down, but it's not going to break that box. It's a steel box. You know what I mean? So they'll have to dig you out of there, but you won't die. Right? That's it's so better scary. than going into the mud pit and the Anderson shelter out back. You know what I mean? I I With the rodents, the rats, and stuff like that. that. <laughs> These are the radar stations uh, that were along the coast of Britain. Okay, And then this is a famous photograph. Um, any of you guys been to London? Okay. 
Uh, London, they have they call it the tube, okay? And um, when the air raids were coming, they would do the sirens, you know? I mean, there's an air raid coming, you know? So people tried to get underground. Now, the government really didn't want people to go down into these because a lot of these are built just a few feet underneath roads. And so if a bomb hits the road, this whole thing's going to collapse on these people, okay? And that did happen. But you weren't going to stop people from going down there because they wanted to get underground. Can't blame them. They didn't have enough air raid shelters for everybody, okay? So people did this. Um, another place people tended to hide was under, like, bridges. You know, like you have a bridge you can get up underneath there. Bad idea. Bridges are targets. They hit the bridge, you're under the bridge. Okay. Now, you see these spotlights here? Um, these were also manned uh, many times by women. Um, these were used outside the cities. Now, they had blackouts, guys. So, you guys know what blackout is, right? Where you turn off all the lights in the city. Any guys ever flown at night? Okay, you can see the cities, right? I mean, you see all the lights. So, you turn off all the lights in the city. And, guys, the British took this to an extreme, okay? So like they had patrols, and if you were letting any light out of your home, you would get fined, all right? You, they, all the train cars had the windows blacked out, uh, headlamps on automobiles blacked out, okay? Which created a whole lot of accidents. No street lamps, so people were walking around the city in pitch black, running into each other, running into things, I read about people drowning, falling into the river. I just, you couldn't see anything. It was all pitch black, okay? We did blackouts in the United States, too. We practiced this during World War II. New York City did it, uh, where they turned off all the lights. Um, but we weren't getting bombed. They were getting bombed, okay? And the Germans can use radar and different instruments to try and find the cities. But if the lights are all off, it makes it a little more difficult. Okay, so once... They approached the cities and they heard them. You know, they heard the bombers coming. They flip on these uh, spotlights so that the anti-aircraft guns could try and spot them in the air and shoot them down. Okay, so these became an important tool as well. As I mentioned at the end yesterday, I mean, they're going to get to do some primitive things here to, for survival purposes. But uh, there's a good picture of the spotlights. Um, this is one of the anti-aircraft guns called the ak, -AK guns. Um, and then these pictures all of children, okay? And one of the sad parts of this, guys, not just children leaving their families, many would never see their parents again. Okay, a lot of them would never see their fathers again. But every, every one of these pictures, see these little boxes? Okay, those are uh, gas masks. Okay, in World War I, obviously, they used poisonous gas. So when the Germans started bombing, there was a real fear in England that they would bomb them with poisonous gas. Uh, fortunately, they did not. But it's kind of a scary proposition. I mean, we do this with this quarantine and all the crap we're going through, wearing masks and stuff, teaching school children um, how to put on a gas mask. Okay, that's, as a teacher, that's, you know, that's frightening. Okay, to have to do that. And uh, the British people provided every citizen that wanted a gas mask with a gas mask, and they made them for infants, too. Okay? Um, it was a scary proposition. Cute little British kids there. <laughs> Limeys. Okay. Now, like I said, guys, uh, now the Germans are going to try, uh, this attachment here is to cut through the uh, steel cable. Okay? It didn't turn out too well for this German plane here. Okay, this one obviously crashed. Okay, um, now this one over here. Okay, why do I know this stuff? Because I wrote that big paper. Okay, and so I did all kinds of crazy research, read a bunch of books on it, and so forth. Now this thing here it is called a parachute and cable system. I know we just talked about PACs in government class, but this is a little different. Okay. <laughs> okay, so... You've got an airfield, all right? And the Germans are going to uh, bomb your airfield. Okay, so you have these rockets lined up across the airfield. Okay, and they come to attack. Okay, these rockets fire into the air. 
and they all have a steel cable attached. And then there's a little parachute that pops out. It's basically building a wall of steel cables. I am recording. Can you see it? Yeah, they can see it. It's over here. I don't have the uh, thing on. No, the sound's on. Everything's good. Uh, Emma's, Emma's with us. She's the only one. Thanks, Emma. Yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah, so basically, if a plane flew through this, dive bomber comes through this, it's going to rip its wing off. Now, in all the research I did on this, I read it one time this worked. Okay? And it did. It ripped the wing off of a German bomber, dive bomber, and it crashed. This pilot survived, and, like, the townspeople came out and grabbed it. Okay? But, yeah, there were eyewitness accounts of this working. Okay? But, I mean, how much time and money did they spend on this? And it happened one time. <laughs> all right. Now, like I said, we're going to get uh, medieval here. All right? So, I'm really glad the Germans didn't come up with this idea. The British came up with this idea, but didn't end up having to use it. Right? So remember, if the Germans win the air war in the Battle of Britain, they will invade by sea. Okay, They're going to use landing craft to come across the channel. Okay, And what the British did, they knew, if you watched any of the video yesterday, okay, there are certain parts of the English coast that have these big white cliffs, okay? The Germans are not gonna land where those big white cliffs are, because then they're gonna have to scale those cliffs, and it's easy to just shoot at. You know what I mean? That would be stupid. So the British knew when, they would, when the Germans came, where they would land, okay? So they took PVC pipe. You guys know what like, like white PVC pipe is? Okay, they drilled holes in it, okay? And then they put it out into the surf, into the water, okay? Just, you know, 100 yards out. And then, in case of an invasion, they would pump oil into that. The oil would come out of the PC pipe, out of the holes, coating the water surface with oil. And all it takes is one of these with a fire on it, incinerating the ships coming in. I'm really glad the Germans didn't think about this on D-Day. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a great idea. Okay, now it's not real environmentally <laughs> but it's a great idea. Okay, now I know we live in Kansas, but let me show you something. Okay, if you're ever on a river or on a lake and you see this sticking out of the water, okay, and it's red or green, it's a what? Buoy. It's a buoy. Okay. <laughs> Now, what you want to do if you're driving a boat is stay between the red buoy and the green buoy. Because if you get outside the red or green buoy, it's shallow. And your engine or your boat's going to hit the ground and you're going to go like that. Okay? And that's not fun. Okay? Uh, so, but in the River Thames, that you, would, you could come up from the English Channel up the River Thames River in there. It's a big river. And they built these. Okay, so underneath this, it looks like a buoy. Okay, but it's not a buoy. It's a bomb. <laughs> no, it's a big pontoon thing, okay, that you can pump the water out of. And then this rises up out of the sea, and you've got machine guns and artillery up here. <laughs> and you're freaking pounding their navy. That's what that is. That's right what there. that is. Yes. Mines? Yeah, why are those underwater? Mines are used to stop opposing navies from coming in. Yeah, you can lower this. Yeah. Now, this is still out there today. And there was this guy that went out there and claimed it as his own country. <laughs> okay, in the middle of the river. Okay, still out. That's in the middle of the river? Yeah. That's a big river. Yeah. Do you know what the country is named? 
it's in English. Oh, I forgot. What <laughs> okay. Um, I don't have pictures of some of the other stuff they did, but um, like where the, there were gradual cliffs or, you know, hills that would lead down to the coast. I mean, the townspeople, they they'd do things like, you know, like a, an old oil barrel, you know, those round big barrels. They would uh, put spikes in them and then coat it with lime. So in case the Germans came, they could like light it on fire and push it down the hill at them. Like, you know, some medieval stuff. Um, <laughs> England and Scotland are the birth, birthplace of what famous sport? That they just had the Masters tournament this golf. weekend. Golf. Okay. There's a lot of golf courses in England. Okay. If the Germans were to invade, they would be easy, easy to traverse the countryside through these golf courses. You know, it's just wide open spaces. They play Lynx golf over there. Um, so what they did is they emptied, you know, the dumps like with old cars and refrigerators, and they built just walls across the, the the golf courses. They tore down every street sign in the country. So if the German paratroopers came in, they wouldn't be able to use the street signs to know which way was what. You know what I mean? Um, so everything you could conceivably think of. You know what I mean? The British were prepared for. And I just found that really interesting, where you have a whole population, 48 million people, totally impacted by this. It's an island, okay, and how they survive, and the importance of that survival, so that one day the United States could come into the war to the rescue and the liberation of Europe. Pretty cool story, Battle of Britain, all right? But in reality, it comes down to the air war and the RAF. Their pilots and their planes defeated the German pilots and their planes. So the invasion never took place. It was called Operation Sea Lion, okay? And phase one was the air, phase two was invasion by a sea, and phase three was taking over the country. And they never got past phase one, okay? And so Hitler will give up on Britain, and he's going to turn his attention where? To Russia, yeah, to the Soviet Union. Okay, so eventually he's going to have a two-front war, right? The Americans are going to be on one side with the British, the Russians on the other side. Two-front war, he's flanked, okay, and that's going to be his downfall. Good? All right, it's time for another presidential election. Roosevelt's going for number three, okay? Originally elected in 1932, re-elected in 36. Re-elected in 1940. The Republicans this time will put up a guy named Wendell Wilkie. Mr. Wendell. Okay. Mr. Wendell Wilkie uh, opposed the New Deal like Alf Landon before him from Kansas. Okay. Uh, they had the same foreign policy. This is good. This is really good for the country. Okay. Both parties agreed on conscription, which is the draft. To be conscripted is to be drafted into the military. Okay. Just in case. We're not going to war yet. No, we're not going to war. Okay? Just in case. We need to train some soldiers. We need to, like, you know, come up with some new uniforms and stuff. Because it's a different time. All right? And so they're going to start drafting men between the ages of 18 and 35. They quickly realize it's a bad idea to draft men in their 30s. Okay? One... They have families. Two, they're important to their communities. Okay. Three, they're out of shape. <laughs> but you take the young bucks, they don't have that. You know what I mean? So they started dropping that number. Okay. Now, more than no more than 900,000 could be called in the service at one time. These are some of the first conscripts of World War II for the Americans. We did not have enough guns. We did not have enough boots. We did not have enough uniforms. All of that stuff's going to have to be made. Okay. And so eventually we will switch over to, you know, wartime uh, industry. And uh, we'll talk about that in the next chapter. Okay. But, uh, and we've already talked about how we started building like the B-17 bomber in 1935. So we're, you know, the two ocean Navy, we're starting to prepare just in case, which is really smart. 
You don't want to be caught with your. Uh, there's an old saying. <laughs> in case any parents are watching. <laughs> you don't know the old saying. You don't want to get caught with your. Right? You know how to finish that? Yeah. Your pants. <laughs> Down around your knees. Okay? Because then you can't do anything. I mean, you got your pants down around your knees, you can't run. You, you just push them down your ankle. Yeah, it's no better. <laughs> All right. This was a landslide. Let me pull it up. I'll show you. Now, um, Wilkie did better than Alf Landon. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So, uh, Boy, Kansas used to have nine electoral college votes. Look at Florida, 1940. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? California, 22. New York had 47. Philly, 36. Three each here. That's really interesting to look at. Okay. Oh, sorry. Are we good here? Ah. Ah, this is pretty cool. I'm going to open that on the. Okay. So Britain's in trouble, right? We know this, okay? Now, let me tell you something. Churchill is going to pester Roosevelt. I mean, he is telegraphing Roosevelt on a daily basis. We need you to get in the war. We need some help. Will you help us, please? We're in trouble. Help us, help us, help us. Okay? Literally bugging the crap out of, out of, out of Roosevelt. Okay? So he's going to try every legal device. Remember, we have these neutrality acts. Okay? Now, we have ended the arms embargo. Okay? So he's going to try everything to get around stuff. So he would do things like uh, sold uh, weapons to private companies. They would sell them to the Britons. Okay? Uh, this is obviously prior, prior to the arms embargo uh, being ended. Merchant ships. Now, supplies. What do the British need? They need food. They need fuel. They need oil. Okay? Um, there's a lot of rationing in Britain at this time. Now, we know the British like to drink what? Tea. Tea, okay? So we were actually exporting tea to Britain, okay? Um, sugar is difficult, right? Uh, tobacco. Um, there, uh, there's, you know, uh, silk. Women, uh, ladies, uh, used to wear silk stockings. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever worn pantyhose no. in your life. <laughs> Occasionally, like maybe once a year or twice a year, my wife will still wear them. I, you know, um, I just can't imagine having to wear those. Okay, but women wore them. I mean, they did. I mean, they did. They wore them. Silk stockings. Okay, and uh, what did they use the silk for? You know what we needed the silk for? Parachutes. Okay. So those were hard to find. Okay. All right. So, guys, merchant ships that are supplying. Okay, remember the cash and carry? Where the British had to bring their ships over, upload the goods, and they could take it back. That was part of the neutrality act. Okay. These ships are being sunk by German U boats. Okay. Unterboten. Unterboten. Underwater boats, U-boats, submarines, okay? Interpol, okay? Das Boot, all right? Now, so, guys, 
This is horrific. Okay, so a lot of these supplies are being um, a lot of these supplies are being sunk in the Atlantic. So Churchill asked Roosevelt. He said, "Hey, can you use the U.S. Navy to escort our merchant ships across the Atlantic?" <laughs> Roosevelt's like, "No, we can't do that because our ships are going, our Navy's going to get attacked, and we're going to be drawn into the war." We don't want that. So they did devise a plan. How about a trade? We've got some old World War I destroyers that we're not using anymore. Okay? They're sitting on mothballs in Annapolis. They're going to give us use of eight naval and air bases, okay, that the British have for 99-year leases. And we're going to give them 50 World War I destroyers to escort their merchant ships across the Atlantic to hopefully, you know, help them. Now, Churchill promises if Britain loses the war, they will destroy these ships so they don't fall in German hands and be used against us. He knows all about that, doesn't he? Okay. So, a lot of people didn't like this. Right? But we went ahead with it. Now, as teacher... I wanted to find out more about these ships. So I did some research and I found this great website. Okay. These are the eight naval bases. Okay. Most of them in the West, right? They're in the West. Bermuda, Newfoundland, Jamaica. Okay. We get 99 year leases. All right. These are what the World War I destroyers look like. Okay, that we gave them. And then this website documents what happened to every single one of these 50 ships throughout the war. Okay, which is pretty cool. So a lot of these survived it. They were all renamed. The most widely known of the 50, the Campbellton Town, was chosen for the raid of St. Nazarene, France. Packed with explosives, she was rammed into the gate at the Normandy Dry Dock at St. Nazarene. When the charges went off, the dry dock gate was blown off, and the dock was rendered unusable by the Germans. Normandy dry dock was the only dry dock outside of Germany that was large enough to accommodate their large battleship, the Turpins. Uh, so this was like a suicide mission. Well, you know, like you fill the boat with explosives, get it going in that direction, jump off the boat, it goes in the dry dock, boom. Germans can't use it anymore. Pretty good use. Now, some of these are going to get sunk, okay? Uh, by U-boats. Some of them are given to the Germans, or excuse me, to the Russians. Now, Russia is not our ally yet. Not till the next slide. When Germany invades Russia, or the Soviet Union, Russia becomes our ally based on a common enemy named Adolf Hitler. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. friend. Okay, so by default, the Soviets will become an ally. Not yet. But so some of these ships will be given to them. Okay, so if I slide down here a little bit more, uh, the Bath, the Hopewell, renamed the Bath, was sunk by U boat 204. Okay, this one was given to Russia, broken up, survived the war. This one was sunk by U boat 101. This one was sunk by U boat 574, 952. And here's one of those mines you were asking about in the water. Okay. This one, the Rockingham struck a mine in 1944, 30 miles southeast of Aberdeen, sunk while under tow. Okay. It's kind of a cool thing. Okay. When they say broken up, that means to survive the war, they used it for scrap metal. Much information? Sure. But that's okay. Are we good? Good on this one? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't the next slide. I'm sorry, two slides. Yeah. All right, so the British are in trouble. So we're helping. We're helping. Okay. Now, this is famous. This is kind of what's in a lot of the textbooks and so forth. 
Uh, by the way, I don't get these notes from a textbook. You probably, I don't know if you know that. Uh, do we have textbooks? Did I give you textbooks? Yeah. 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 I don't get these from the textbooks. These are my notes. Yeah. They're better. Oh, write your own book. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> lend lease out. Okay. U.S. is going to lend or lease supplies to the British for later payment. Hey, did we try this in World War One? Did we help out our allies in World War One? Yeah, to the tune of like, uh, what was it, nine billion dollars? Did we get that money back? No. no. Oh no, Finland, Finland paid us. <laughs> we are expecting payment. Okay, are we gonna get it? No. No. <laughs> okay, but we do expect it. Okay. Um, now, guess who else we're gonna help? Eventually, we're gonna help the Chinese, and we are gonna help the Russians with land lease. All of these countries will fall under lend lease. It starts with the British, but expands to China and to the Soviet Union. Okay. Before long, American ships, cargo ships, are going to be delivering supplies to Britain. That means American ships are going to be attacked by the German U-boats, which means Americans are going to start dying in this war that we are not in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In mid-1941, there was a secret meeting. Churchill braved the Atlantic in a ship to come meet with Roosevelt. They met up in Nova Scotia. Uh, or New, is it Newfoundland? Uh, Newfoundland, up here. Okay. So Churchill came up this way, braved the Atlantic, because he could have got shot down, you know, shot by a U-boat, and met with Roosevelt here. Okay. This meeting becomes known as the Atlantic Charter. There's your two men. You've got Churchill, this little dumpy man, right? and uh, Roosevelt, okay? And you guys know why they're sitting down, right? Because of Roosevelt, yes? Okay. Now, um, this Atlantic Charter, they are going to say, okay, once the United States gets in the war, how we're going to proceed. This is what this meeting is about, okay? Roosevelt knows at some point we're going to have to get in. The American people are just going to have to suck it up and we're going to have to get in. Okay. It's decided once we get in, we will deal with Europe first and then Asia second. Okay. Well, we'll remember what the Japanese are doing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, <laughs> they're expanding daily, weekly, monthly. Okay. And they're going to start running into some areas that are controlled by the British, by the French, and the Americans, the Philippines. Okay, so that's a real threat. Okay, so they're planning on that. Okay, that we're going to have to deal with the Japanese. Because by this time, the Japanese have become part of the Axis. Part of the German, Italian, Japanese Axis. Those three powers are now working together. Okay. So, you can see uh, there's a barrage balloon. Okay. Doesn't that make it obvious where the stuff is? Well, okay. So these are convoys. So this is this became the method to get ships across. So you see all these ships. These are all cargo ships. And in the middle is where you put your most precious cargo. Now, not yet are we sending troops across. Once we start sending troops across. That is our most precious cargo. You understand? But at this point, it's probably oil in the middle. Okay? So, what they do with these um, convoys, so you got all these ships, right? They would take destroyers, and the destroyers would patrol around the convoys, cruisers and destroyers. They would patrol along the outside looking for German U-boats to protect the convoy as it went across the Atlantic to get them. Okay. Now, the German U-boats traveled in wolf packs, so like packs of five subs, right? And they would attack these convoys. And guys, let me just tell you, during World War II, 4,600 merchant ships were sunk in the Atlantic. Okay, and a little bit more than that in World War One. So, guys, the Atlantic is littered with shipwreckage. 
from the first two world wars. Okay, I'll show you a map of that in a minute. Okay, a little bit later, or maybe now. How about now? This map right here, which I know you can't see very well from back there, but there's a bunch of red dots and there's a bunch of green dots. Red dots are allied merchant, uh, actually these are allied merchant ship losses, and then the green dots are U-boat losses. Okay, now, if you're a fisherman, you're going to fish where the fish are, right? Right? So if you're a German U-boat, you're going to fish where, or hunt, where the ships leave port. You know where the ports are. So they're going to hang out near these ports. And yes, guys, there were German U-boats right off the coast of the United States. So instead of doing blackouts on the coast, they would do lights on. So watch this as I walk by this here. Okay. So I'm the German U-boat. This is Jacksonville, Florida, all the lights. Back here behind me is a U.S. destroyer looking for this, which is a silhouette. Okay? <laughs> and when these submarines surfaced, which these German submarines did have to surface from time to time, you, the, the Navy would see the silhouette. Take it out. Pretty smart, huh? That's bright. <laughs> So, Roosevelt extends the zones necessary to the defense further out in the Atlantic. So, here, see this? You see a German ship in there, a German U boat in there, you fire on it on site. We've got us an undeclared war going on in the Atlantic. Then, Roosevelt sends troops to Greenland up here and Iceland in April and July of 1941 to seize those ports because we don't want those ports falling into Germany. So we can get there first, which is really smart, right? Because if the Germans are gonna like invade or use you know those areas to launch attacks on us, they're gonna need those ports to get close to the United States. So that's pretty smart, okay? Now this in and of itself may be seen as an act of war. Congress authorizes the seizure of 92 German and Italian ships in American harbors. We freeze them. We would not allow them to, to leave the country. Now, that could be seen as an act of war, all right? And then on June 14th, all German and Italian assets in this country were frozen, meaning any businesses that were from, like, Volkswagen, for instance, out of uh, Germany, they could no longer access their accounts in the United States. That way, that money could not be shipped back into those countries and used against us. Okay. So we're kind of, you know, we're kind of stepping up here. Now we're not going, we're not going to declare war or anything like that. We're not going to do anything crazy like that. Okay. We're going to have to be drug into this thing. You guys know what's coming. Okay. So tomorrow's your what? Okay, so tomorrow we're going to get the Operation Barbarossa, which is the invasion of the Soviet Union, Thursday, and Friday, Pearl Harbor. You guys will be here for Friday? Okay, so you'll watch the video over Operation Barbarossa, which is really interesting. I think everything's very interesting. I like it. I like that. And I think we're out of time, guys. Bye, Emma. Have a good day. Hopefully I recorded. I did. <laughs>